What do you think about hardware VPNs slash decentralized VPNs? Saw a video from Unbox Therapy, and I'm not sure about the privacy aspect. Ah, yes. I saw that video from Unbox Therapy as well, and it's something that's been on our radar. That. Basically, what it is, is the idea that I think I pitched to you on WAN Show at some point. I either pitched it to you on WAN Show, or I've talked about it internally, like, oh, wouldn't that be a really cool way to do a VPN, where basically everyone is um it's kind of it's like how yeah everyone's a node and it's kind of like how windows is our windows it's kind of like how microsoft is rolling windows updates now where you contribute to the network to make sure that you know okay say luke and i live in the same apartment building rather than him downloading off of a microsoft server in redmond Obviously, that's not typically how it would be that Microsoft would have the files cached on a data center closer to, to Luke. But rather than pulling the files out of a data center, he would just grab them in as few hops as possible from a nearer node like me in order to accelerate download speeds as well as reduce latency and overall internet congestion. It's actually like a win-win-win to have multiple nodes for downloads rather than centralized servers in, in some cases. Like we've seen situations where a major gaming launch has dragged the internet down to a crawl and that wouldn't have necessarily had to happen with a decentralized file distribution system like uh, like Bit like BitTorrent, for example. Um, so the product that Lou was taking a look at was pretty much the idea that I had talked about before, where instead of being for file distribution, these nodes were for um, internet access from that location. What's really cool about this approach is that by contributing a little bit of your bandwidth, and many people have unlimited data plans these days, by contributing some of your bandwidth and some of your both download and upload speed, right? Because the traffic has to come all the way through, you are gaining access to other users in other regions who are contributing their bandwidth to you so that you can access services and uh, and websites as though you are from that region, just like a VPN would. But what gives it a big advantage over a traditional VPN is that service providers are constantly trying to block VPNs from accessing their services. And there's a hundred reasons that might exist for this, whether it's uh, authoritarian regimes that don't want access to outside information coming across their borders, or whether it's companies that have complicated licensing agreements that allow them to display content in one country, but not in another country because the internet doesn't exist <laughs> in their worldview. <laughs> um, there are lots of reasons why they will aggressively pursue these users who are accessing their content from another region, uh, because in some cases it can open them up to serious legal liability if they are found to be not doing their due diligence to enforce the terms of their license. And so there's this constant game of whack-a-mole where VPN providers are trying to find ways to use safe, non-blocked IPs that are registered to that region. and Service providers are trying to find ways to play whack-a-mole and ban IP blocks that are associated with these VPN services. And it's at the point now where a company like Shadow Tech, you remember Shadow Tech? They had like gaming servers are they still around? in data centers. I don't know if they're still doing it, but they, they were for a while anyway. And then they had a whole like insolvency thing. But Shadow Tech um, had the challenge of trying to find a way to get their, like they actually had to work through services like Netflix to get their IP blocks unbanned because it got to the point where service providers just basically said, okay, we're just going to just block list every IP that's associated with a data center because any commercial VPN service that is running out of a data center is going to be on these IP blocks. And really, there's no reason that, you know, some cloud server for some infrastructure is going to need to watch movies on Netflix anyway. So the fact that there were consumers using these, these data center IPs was a challenge that they had to solve. And it was as simple as getting Netflix to allow them. They were just, they just had to demonstrate that it was not inordinate use coming through this IP, which is pretty trivial for them to detect. Like, okay, you know, 
five people or whatever the amount they allow per account or could not possibly be watching this much Bridgerton or whatever, right? <laughs> um, and where was I going with this? Right, right, right. So the advantage is that by having all of these nodes, it becomes extremely difficult to play that game of whack-a-mole efficiently, right? To just mass ban anything that could possibly be associated with a commercial service and move on to the next thing. And because theoretically, if the network gets large enough, that traffic could be spread out so much, it would be it would be really hard for them to even detect it through like a brute force method, like looking at how much use is coming through it and, and, and blocking that IP. Now they could get aggressive and start trying to 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 block everything that they suspect is a multiple user, but they'd end up irking a lot of customers. And now that Netflix charges so much, you don't want to you don't want to create friction with your legitimate paying customer, right? So any overly aggressive attempt to curb undesirable behaviors, like hosting a VPN that other users are tunneling through, yeah. it runs the risk of causing people to cancel your service, which doesn't look great on your you know quarterly revenue reports because you're a public company, right? I mean, there's a lot of places where there isn't really ISP competition. That's that's fair, uh, especially in the states. But I meant for Netflix, people could yeah. cancel that service. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and that's not a good look. Yeah. Um, Winter says just use a PIA static IP and generate a new one each month. That service that PIA offers, if I recall, does it cost more? I can't remember. Uh, but that service that so. PIA offers so much so. is difficult to maintain. Finding new, especially IPv4 IPs these days is not, well, it's easy, but it's not cheap, yeah. is, what yeah, I will, yeah, yeah. is what I will say about that. I don't know. There's, there's... So the downside. Yeah. All of your internet traffic is going through some midpoint that you do not control. Kind of same vice versa on that coin. Theoretically, theoretically, there's a bunch of internet. You are encrypting it you. before yeah. it goes through. But my understanding is that there's no way to encrypt what comes back to you. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, almost everything is HTTPS now. Like it's there's still some that isn't though. You're right. Especially like government like websites, which I find very funny. Um, low level, like uh, municipal government websites, I find a lot of them kind of still aren't. Um, I don't know. I, I've read some stuff that apparently like certain, uh, what were they called? Deeper or whatever? Uh, deeper network. Apparently, I don't know. I've read some stuff on this. I, I wasn't prepared for this topic, so I'm sorry. Um, but I've read that they're, they're looking to being more open about certain things. Not that they've necessarily been notably closed off about certain things, but they're, they're interested in being more open about certain things. Like it's, it, I don't know. It could be very interesting. It's a little sketch though in my opinion. I'm going to maybe invite a surprise guest to the show. Let's see if he picks up. Uh, hey, Dan, you're... Um, wait, I forget. Is it Dan or Danny? Dan's good. Great. Um, you're on the WAN show, so you're, you're live right now. I was talking about how IPv4 addresses are getting, I won't say difficult to obtain, but certainly expensive to obtain. And we've had some people in the chat kind of saying, well, they can't be that expensive. Uh, you know, surely, you know, you could afford them easily, Linus, but I remember the last time I talked to you about this being just utterly blown away by how expensive it was for a block of IPv4 addresses. And I was wondering if you'd be willing to kind of give us the, the latest on that. Yeah, it's about 50 bucks US an IP right now, buying in bulk per IP. And that's up from a year ago, about 24. And that's, that's you know, finite resource, rapidly depleted and the price is raising by almost 100% a year. So you're saying that if I wanted to invest, instead of Vancouver real estate, I should actually buy IPv4 addresses? You could. You'd have to get an ASN and, you know, be an ISP and then get a RIN to let you have an allocation and then you could go buy them. But you could do that. Okay, but you'd sort that out for me, right? Sure. 
Okay. All right. All right. Cool. Uh, thanks, Dan. Good chat. I guess we haven't talked in a long time, but that means the service is working well. So that's a good thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Good to hear. No, no problem. Lines. All right. Talk to you later, man. Yeah. Have a good one. Okay. Bye. <laughs> Um, that, that's, I tell our ISP is amazing. Um, I don't know if everyone gets the same kind of service, but I can literally call up their CTO <laughs> pretty much whenever I want and ask them stuff. Uh, so they've, they've helped us do some really, really cool stuff with our connection. We pay dearly for the service. Yeah. Uh, and I'm not sure how much sense it's going to make forever. Hopefully he doesn't watch this because Telus now has two and a half gig residential connections. Just like bond a couple of those. <laughs> Uh, probably fine, but anyway, the point is, yeah, fifty freaking bucks. Yeah, I mean, we have to lot. we have to get IPs for Floatplane, right? So it's a lot of freaking money. Yeah, and that's bulk. Yeah. Do you, oh, do you know cost, how much we pay for Floatplane? Because we're buying at much lower volumes than them. Uh, I I mean I could figure it out. Yeah, it's okay. Don't don't, don't worry don't too much about it. Head, though, but um. Crap, what was I going to say? Yeah, just everything's getting worse. Like, you, you know, we're working on the, the infrastructure 2.0 stuff. Mm -hmm. Servers that we want to get for that. Like, it, you, when we first started working with OVH, you probably even remember this. Yeah. I would procure a server and it would be up in like minutes. Super fast. Some of the stuff that we're getting now is like, we're getting them to customize the hardware and stuff. So yeah, that's going to take a moment longer. Yeah. But like you expect, okay, maybe, you know, tomorrow. Or something, right? Now it's like, hmm, not sure. Might be done by the end of the month. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh man, Heart, like everything in that space is just getting so rough. It, it makes sense though. With like, I mean, we've had chip shortage for going on for so long now, and so many things are going online, and the online space is just massively exploding as it has been for years. So, yeah, I don't know. It's interesting how much the internet has changed even in the last ten years. Because like, yeah, sure, it's existed. But yep. the amount, the the degree to which it's ubiquitous at this point is... It's Web 3.0 now. Oh, 